Hi folks, so uh, it's been a while now in lockdown and we felt that it would be helpful to do the Super Women Sessions which is a series of uh, talks with people in film, TV and broadcast about how to navigate this strange time and prepare for coming out the other side of COVID-19. Today it is the world of broadcast and we are joined by presenter, DJ and podcaster Kate Lawler who does the weekday drive time show on Virgin Radio, amongst many other things. Hi, Kate. Hi. How are you doing? How is lockdown treating you? You are still actually broadcasting the show every day, aren't you, from the studios? But yeah, how's it going? What's life like? You know what? I'm quite lucky. I'm quite fortunate enough to still be going to work. Every day is different for me. So some days I panic when I'm on my way and thinking I should be working from home. I did set up a studio at home, but uh, we're all doing shows from Virgin. Uh, most of the shows are coming from um, the news building, which usually has about 3,000 people working in it every day. I've never seen it so quiet. It is, I'm driving in, the roads are dead, the congestion charge has been waived, NCP car parks, the barriers are up, like 24-7. So it's a really quiet, quite eerie, but enjoyable drive in because no traffic and then when I get to work um hardly any people there but Virgin Radio are making sure everybody sticks to the two meter two meter rule so we're, we're only like there's about four people in the office so I'm quite fortunate because I get to you know have some normality in my life like going to work every day my routine hasn't changed at all Monday to Friday I'm still getting up at half seven I'm walking the dogs at nine till ten I'm doing a bit of a longer walk now and then I prep my show at home which I've always done and then I go to work and I'm home by about eight o'clock the only difference is the weekends not going out not going to a pub not going to a restaurant um but you know I'm grateful I've got a roof over my head I've got my dogs I've got the internet I've got telly I've got books I've got the handsome we live together I've got company you can facetime family and friends when you put it into perspective about into perspective like how people were back in world wars and being sent off to fight for their country and die. Like we don't have it that bad. I know not everyone's the same and there's a lot of families struggling and people have lost their jobs and they can't afford to feed their children. But broadly speaking, I think most people having to like be told that they've got to stay at home and entertain themselves with the internet and books and telly, it's, it's not that bad. It's just the worry of how long we're going to have to do it for. What was your, um, your path into um, TV and, uh, sorry, radio and broadcasting? And did you like always want to be doing this? No, do you know what? I never, ever like thought about going into radio. But after I did Big Brother, which was like 18 years ago now. <gasps> 18 years ago. That makes me feel so old. I am old. 14 <laughs> By the way, I'm going to be spending my 40th birthday on lockdown. Brilliant. Um, oh, no! Can't complain. As long as I've got my health, I'm happy. Um, so I did Big Brother in 2002. And then after that, I got um, a job covering... Do you remember Steve Penk? Yes. On Capital, I covered his late show. And then I did a hit music Sunday show with Andy Peters um, for a year on Capital. And then I went off and like, I learned to DJ and I was DJing and stuff. And then Kerrang Radio got in touch, <clears throat> excuse me, in 2007 and asked if I wanted to do their breakfast show. So I moved to Birmingham and did the breakfast show there. Stayed at Kerrang for, I don't know, five years. And then I moved to Manchester. And then I moved to Virgin Radio in 2016. But it wasn't something I always wanted to do. I think after Big Brother, lots of opportunities present themselves to you. So like, I'm always kind of like, I'm quite a yes person. So I thought, yeah, I'll give it a go. If I don't like it, I can always go back to working in IT help desk, uh, which I never did. And I'm really thankful I didn't because I really enjoy the radio. Um, yeah, that's how I got into it though. And has it been quite a mad one seeing how reality TV has changed? Because Big Brother was kind of like the OG of, of reality TV, wasn't it? And you went, you were, what, series three? That you three. Well done, Georgie. Series three. Knowledge. Uh, <laughs> don't know if anyone remembers that. W won it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sure. People forget. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> um, first woman to win as well. Um, yeah. It, it was that you're right. It was the OG of reality TV. It's changed so much. But also, like, when you look at things like Love Island, it's so similar to Big Brother. It's everybody in a house, like fancying each other and arguing and 
it's so similar yet it's moved on and there's just been so many different reality tv shows between big brother and love island i mean wow you've had everything haven't you um but it, it's been interesting and it's flown by when i look back at like my time in big brother which is actually not too dissimilar to what we're going through now like, i was on lockdown i was in a house i couldn't leave i didn't have TV, I didn't have books, I didn't have the internet, didn't have a phone, I couldn't see anyone. Um, but yeah, in a weird way, so kind of like I didn't have all my luxuries, but in a weird way, I, I preferred it because I knew that it was going to be 12 weeks maximum, there was an end date in sight and potentially £70,000 prize money. So that's kind of got, what got you through it. I think mean, what's hard now with this lockdown is that we just don't know how long it's going to go on for. Yeah. I've totally question you asked about reality tv by talking about sorry no it's good, it's good. Big, big desi shout out big desi your dad didn't Love he him. predict that you'd he, he was like oh you'll win that didn't he yeah, yeah. he did yeah. such a jive my dad i love him but he was like when i told him i was going in he was like you'll win it and i was like well the thing is dad it's um a straight guy won the first year, a gay guy won the second year. It's time that a female won the show. So I think I'm going in, I've got a very good chance, like straight away because I'm female, like people would want a woman to win. And I think that year they really did want a woman to win. So if it wasn't me, it would have been Alison Hammond or it would have been Jade Goody, do you know what I mean? So um, yeah, but Big Desi Boy predicted, but he didn't put any, any money on it, the idiot. <laughs> didn't put any money. Yeah, you know, I just, just knew you'd win anyway, <laughs> yeah. So when, when you came out of that and you went into broadcasting, did you just have to kind of learn on the fly or did you like, I don't know, have any mentors or do any training? Like, how did you learn? I still don't know what I'm doing, mate. I didn't learn anything. <laughs> I, honestly, I've got a massive case of imposter syndrome, I think because of that, because I never trained. When I went into radio, everybody in radio was so clever and intelligent and they'd been to university and they'd done hospital radio and they just had all this experience and I just was like, oh hi, I won Big Brother in 2002, I'm now on the radio. And it was like, I think that's why I still have massive imposter syndrome. So I feel like when I get asked what I do for a living, I hate saying I'm a radio presenter because I still don't feel like I am. I still, I'm just like, I'm on the radio, I'm playing music and being stupid and that's my job. And I find it really hard to say that that's what I do for a living. Um, but yeah, you are just thrown in at the deep end. If you win a reality TV show, it's like, you get offered some weird, wacky shit, like, hey, it's the Daily Sport here, we wanna pay for you to get your boobs done, on the basis, get them out on the front page of our paper, yes or no? And you're like, oh, thank you, not for me, I'm okay for that. Um, and then you get offered like crazy shit, like an OK Magazine deal came in, and like, I think the first OK Magazine shoot I did was just like more money that I could ever imagine. It was like the most money I've ever got for any job. And I was just like, my life has just changed so much. Um, but then that wasn't really work. That was just a, a magazine shoot. But in terms of work, yeah, I just went straight into presenting. There were times where I'd be like, they want you to screen test me for something. So I'd go in and screen test. I didn't have a clue what I was doing. Um, so you kind of do learn on the job, especially with TV and radio. Like I remember working with a guy called Tim Shaw. Do you remember Tim Shaw, Georgie? The name rings a bell. Probably because he, he's like, he's, he's, the D, he's the DJ that's been fired from the most radio stations in the UK. Like, he holds that record. He just, whenever he got a job in radio, he'd just end up getting fired. Um, <laughs> but what he was like, and he's like a TV guy as well. He comes up, he's, he's, an, I, the, he's a proper ideas guy. And he, watching him work, I did a breakfast show on Kerrang! with him. And I was just like, first proper job really in radio and I just watched him work and I learned so much from the few months that we worked together then he got himself fired um so that was at the end of our relation working relationship but he was just insane like watching him edit watching how he interviewed people watching him drive the desk I like I learned so much from Tim and in such a short space of time and then I guess everything else I've learned from producers and my peers at Kerrang and Virgin and stuff yeah but talking on the radio for a living, like it is, it is a skill. Even though, like you, you know, you came into it through a like a different route. Um, but once you do kind of become a broadcaster and you get better at it and you learn all these things all the time, like you do need to sort of have some attributes, I think, for for that being your job, talking on the radio every day. 
what would you yeah. what would you say those are? I mean, I suppose confidence is one. Do you think Big Brother, the experience of being on Big Brother, where you kind of you can't edit yourself, you can't censor yourself, you you kind of have to forget that the cameras are there. Do you think that stood you in good stead with then for being really comfortable, like behind a mic or in front of the camera? Massively, yeah. I've got no filter. I tell everything. What I, I talk about everything that happens to me on the radio. So you've got some um, presenters who are real music focused, like really passionate about the songs, albums, artists, and everyone like that. I'm the complete opposite. I love music, but what I like to do is tell stories and talk about what's happening in my life. Um, bit selfish, but there's always something to talk about, and I love looking at the news and talking about that as well. But that's where I think from Big Brother as well, where you just, everything was uncensored and whatever you did, people knew about. So I kind of think that I just, I just took that across when I, when I went to the radio, I was just talking about what I did every day and it just kind of worked for me. So yeah, I sometimes too, do probably share too much. And I always say that, I'm like, probably shouldn't be sharing this, but I'm gonna do anyway. Um, that's the kind of style I've got. Um, but I do also love working on a music radio station and getting the chance to play songs that I love. Do you think that's important for um, like young broadcasters to just like have a style and have a tone and a voice? Yeah, yeah, but I think you'll just find it naturally. Like there was no way that I was going to do a Georgie Rogers on the radio. Like I remember listening to Georgie when I was living in Manchester. She was on XFM and I'm driving home from the late show at 1am and she'd just come and I'd be like, oh my gosh, she's so cool. I'd love to be able to present like Georgie Rogers. And you like your passion for the music and your knowledge about like music just from like across all the genres and all the years and decades gone by like you just know everything whereas I'm like how does she know so much I mean you might well be wikipedia the shit out of it before every show but I just think it's there it's got it that's who you are you love you're so passionate about it um I had Brandon Flowers on my show the other day from the killers and I was I was so nervous. I was like, oh my God, this is where I, like, I feel like I can't. What do I say to Brandon Flowers? And I was just like, first thing I said to him, I was like, you got any dogs? <laughs> what are your pets? What's your dog? <laughs> and eventually we started talking about his album, but my confidence, like I, I was more confident talking to him about, like I said to him, last time I, I heard your voice, you were at Brixton Academy uh, doing a show. And he was like, God, that was a few years ago. And I was like, yeah, it was. And I was like, you know what? That's where Billy Joel recorded the music video to We Didn't Start the Fire. I think it was, at any rate, I think it was that. And he was like, no. And I was like, yeah, and Kathleen Turner and Michael Douglas and Danny DeVito are all in the music video. And they're all in white because they were promoing uh, Romancing the Stone. And we ended up talking about like Romancing the Stone for half an hour instead of the album. Because I just, that's what, I'm just comfortable talking about other stuff that isn't music. It's weird. Because I'm on a music radio station, I should be comfortable with that, but. I just think my confidence just is more like, let's talk about stuff that isn't that. Whereas Georgie, like, music, music, music. <laughs> yeah, I know, but then I wish I could do more of the story, you know, like I, I need to work on, I find I need to work on my storytelling um, to kind of, because the music stuff sort of comes naturally. I think there's just a whole process, isn't there? Of, like you finding what you're comfortable with and what your comfort zone is. Yeah. But then, but then you always sort of feel like you want the other thing as well. I don't know, it's hard. It's, it's hard yeah. to kind of decide what kind of broadcaster you are, but then you sort of find your way with it. I don't know. Oh, whatever you call it There's been moments where I'm like, right, I need to show more music passion. And I've almost tried to emulate another radio presenter because I thought that, you know, I should show more music passion. But then I do it. And then my producer's like, you're just wagging on about the music just then for no reason. I was like, I was trying to be passionate. And he was like, shut the fuck up and talk about yourself please because that's where your strengths are and I was yeah. like oh, okay do you know what I mean it's like um someone said a while ago it's like don't ever try and be someone else because you'll yeah. only ever be a bad version of them you just have to try and be yourself but it's a it's such a weird thing when you're in a room essentially I mean you have Jamie your producer but when you're in a room essentially on your own talking to and that's the radio that I've done for years when I was on yeah. it was me in a studio controlling the whole thing with no producer no one else around just me essentially talking to myself <laughs> yeah there's other people listening and there's in people included in that but it's quite it's weird it's a very weird job isn't it <laughs> it's 
fit job. Like I've been there, babes, where I've not had a. I worked for years with no producer at Kerrang, at Key. Actually, no, Key was I did have a producer, but um, when you're on your own and you're just in charge of everything and you're just talking into a microphone, but you feel like you're talking to nobody, but you know that people are listening. You, you, you forget people are listening. You genuinely think, feel like you're talking to yourself. Um, but that's the difference between live radio. Like when I pre-record anything, it just doesn't have that same vibe. You do genuinely don't feel like you're on the radio. But even though you're in a room still talking on your own, if you're live, you do feel like people are listening. Because obviously you want people texting in and tweeting and stuff. But it is a weird job. Like I, when I got asked to host something recently, I was like, I can't do that. And they were like, why not? I was like, I was a thousand people there. And they were like, you talk on the radio every day. I was like in a quiet room to myself. Like I'm not used to going out on stage talking to thousands of people. That still scares me. And they were like, why? And I was like, I don't know. Just because I'm not used to doing that. Do you know what I mean? I don't host events with loads of people staring at me like that. Ah. <laughs> because that's well, whenever you do stuff like that, everyone's just like, ah. <laughs> you know? They do it the way they do it. And you're like, is anyone having a good time? so i've got a question for both of you because it is like it's so different to what i do and like i'm hidden behind a camera and like what was it like the first time you were both live on air and like was it terrifying georgie you answer that first i mean yeah uh it was when was the first time well the first time i was on air was in jersey i got i had to cover a radio show with 15 minutes notice <clears throat> on oh, channel wow. channel 103 in jersey and i had to do like the surf report and um like the local town happenings which was quite jokes like a flower show this weekend <laughs> and I remember, I remember being like oh my god this is like the adrenaline was just like firing through me but i think um six music because when six music when i started there i had a bit of experience at xfm just as an intern and virgin so i'd done a few bits on air by that point and student radio and stuff but when i did my first live bulletin on six music i remember just being like you've got to figure out some kind of coping mechanism to not freak out because suddenly you feel like i mean there's way more people listen to the station now so now and if i do radio too oh my god it's like there could be millions of people listening right now but um there's just something i don't know I've, I've kind of i think in that first moment i just found some kind of weird internal switch where you just switch and it's like you're on and just don't think about external the amount of people listening the numbers what people's react you just have to just just do it it's like fight or flight isn't it I agree i don't think Sorry, I don't remember ever being nervous when I did my first ever show on Capital, covering for Steve Penk. I think I was too young, too caught up in the moment, not realising what a big deal it was. I honestly don't, don't remember feeling as anywhere near as nervous as I did recently when I covered Chris Evans' breakfast show on Virgin Radio. That, to me, was just like the scariest thing ever because you were standing in such big shoes and he is like such a legendary broadcaster and you know that he's got millions of listeners. And I remember just cut like the first link. I was, I mean, I've worked in radio like full time since 2007, yeah. I mean, it was only it would have been a few months ago. And I remember just heart racing, sweaty top lip. I was nervous. I was like, I'm going to start speaking really fast because I speak really fast when I'm nervous. And I was more nervous about that, even though I've done radio for all these years, than doing my first ever link on the, that radio station where I covered for Steve Pink. It's weird, isn't it? Yeah. You just have to have a big deep breath, don't you? And then just like jump in the pool. <laughs> <laughs> jump in the pool. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, you do. But actually, once you start talking, it's all okay. Like, the, you just need to get the microphone open. And once you start talking, then it becomes easier. It's that just that first bit. But it's great to have adrenaline, I think. Mm. I think it's good to be... Um, I, don't, I, I can't imagine not feeling nervous. I think it gives me a bit of a buzz to feel like that. Do you ever feel yeah. like things are, like, going wrong? And, and what do you do to recover it? Play a tune. <laughs> <Yeah. Play. laughs> All the time. Yesterday, I had to play Billy Joe Armstrong for alone now because he's covered it, right? Have you heard his cover of that song? No. Um, prefer to. 
Um, but Billy Joe Armstrong, Green Day legend, right? I've said his name a few times on the radio. Yesterday, I couldn't say his name. I said, Billy, Billy Bo Armstrong, Billy, Billy Doe. I said, Billy Doe, instead of Billy Joe. And then I tried to say his name again. I messed it up. And I was just like, um, I'm just, I'm done. I'm going home. And it was only 20, 20 minutes left. I was like, I'm out of it. Uh, but then you just play a song and then you just beat yourself up and then you just go, okay, I'm just going to make a joke out of it. And then I did in the next link. Um, but yeah, things go wrong all the time. When in doubt, just stop talking and play a song. Georgie? With I, I, yeah, play a song always. That's like the fail safe. Just stop talking and getting yourself further into the hole. <laughs> um, I called David Bowie, David Blowy on the radio. <laughs> that was good. <laughs> Took a big run up into like a new segment with Sean and they did not let me uh, like instant, like they just all pissed themselves in the studio. And um, yeah, then we got a lot of texts and tweets being like, that was the greatest moment ever. Like I just spat my coffee out uh, <laughs> early, early breakfast and I just went really earnestly went into it and called him David Blowy. <laughs> I bet Sean, like kept that on a hot key and just kept playing it out didn't he <laughs> so good they, yeah they did not let me forget it <laughs> I want to say but it's those moments that are actually you know like everyone makes mistakes and uh, like as long as you don't get anyone in trouble or you don't yeah. like, I think um I think sometimes like being negative is just not helpful to anyone if you're like you know trash talking someone or I like I, uh, someone said ages ago in a seminar like don't ever tweet if you're pissed or pissed off like there's like that you know but then when you do make a, an honest mistake like that can make for radio gold yeah yeah I once said Coldplay this is I, I went to say right now on Virgin Radio in fact it wasn't Virgin Radio it was years ago but I but because everyone like I've always been asked this question have you ever sworn accidentally on and it's only once and I said clocks by Coldplay but I didn't say clocks I said cocks <laughs> HR <laughs> by Coldplay. Oh, I think I meant to say clock. Apologies if you're afraid by what I just said. <gasps> yeah, that's the go-to as well. It's like I'm really sorry if anyone was offended by what I just said. <laughs> just cover your back. We once left a microphone out in the office of a radio station I worked at for Virgin, and we just was like, oh. Our office is so rock and roll. We just left this roving mic on like a like a square stand on the desk, and we just put the fader up of the, so you could hear what was going on in the office. And someone walked up to the microphone and went, "Cunt," <laughs> and we were like that. <gasps> we pulled the mic fader down, and we were all just like that. <laughs> I, if you're offended by what you just heard. Here's a song, and we had so much trouble because, like, that microphone had been there for the whole show for about three hours. And in one second, we put it up, just put the fader up. Someone just walked up, <laughs> like that. Someone just went, Come, and walked off. <laughs> they just walked off. And went out radio station. I mean, can't believe we didn't get fired for that. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> How are you finding drive time? Because you move from um, from afternoons to drive time, which is, you know, it's a coveted slot and you're kind of top to tail with Chris Evans, the big the big C, C dog. The big C, I love it. I love drive time. I really did, uh, from a selfish point of view, I really did like working one till four. <clears throat> one till four is like the ultimate slot for any DJ because you can have a lay in, you can get stuff done in the morning and you're home by five o'clock. It's so lush. But, Drive time is a massive gig. And so when I was asked to take over, I was beside myself. And I was like, there's definitely been a mistake here. And again, I was like, are you sure? I love it. And I can tell more people are listening as well, which is really, really nice. Um, and we're building up a nice little family. And I love working with my producer, Jamie. He's just so much fun. And he's really good at his job. And he makes me like, cause I'm so, I'm distracted all the time. So he just keeps me focused. And yeah, we're having a really good time. We like had we had so much planned for this year um, on air and it's just all been paused because of what's happening. So it's a shame, but we know that it will eventually like we'll get we'll come around to do it eventually. So yeah, I'm I'm having a really nice time on drive though. And I really like covering for Chris in the mornings as well, because he's just got so many listeners. Like when you cover for him, the text messages you get just insane. 
Uh, but I really do enjoy drive time. Jamie's a legend. I love watching him in your in your Instagram stories. He's so funny. And your relationship is so beautiful, the way that you bounce off each other. And it must be so weird right now. I mean, you're making a lot of it in a funny way. It's like, stay back, you know, four meters. And he's on the other side of the studio, like a little, little kind of temporary desk. How are you finding it? Like not being able to have that like closeness, you know, in real space kind of thing. Oh, I love it. I don't want him near me. He's awful. <laughs> <laughs> he, um, yeah, we've had to put him. So normally he's like, I'm here, and he's just the other side of the desk. He's now in the corner of the room, like he's sat in the corner like a naughty child. It's really funny. And every time he tries to come near me, I'm like, What are you doing? What are you doing, Sam? Back off, because <laughs> he take it seriously. And I'm, he's like, You made me feel like I've got the virus. And I'm like, You might have the virus. I might have the virus. Let's not give it to one another. Do you know what I mean? So like, he's just, um, but it is funny. We are trying to make a joke of it. Um, but also we're being sensible by staying uh, at least six feet away from each other in the studio. Um, yeah, he's ace. He's, he's been at Virgin Radio a year and I did, did you see his one year compilation of best bits on my Instagram the other day, Georgie? No, but I'm gonna watch it. Go on, I made him like, on my grid, there's a one year of jet working, it says one year of working with Jamie and it's like two minute video of all his like best bits. I was just lo just laughing out loud when I was making it because he's such a turnip, but I love him. He went to me the other day, do you know what I really want? And I was like, hot dog? Like he's always eating. And he was like, no, I want a hug. And I was just like, oh, and I really want to give him a cuddle, but obviously I can't because distance. Um, I felt for him because he lives on his own and it must be really hard living on your own right now. That's why I really like being on the radio because for some people, that's all they might have for company. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, like me. I, I'm on my own at the moment. And what? yeah, I've got radio, I've got Zoom, I've got house party. Where's and your... uh, he's, um, he's at my parents helping my mum out. Oh my goodness. It's, it's me and I've never wished that I had a dog more in my life. Babes, <laughs> do you want one of ours? Yeah, I was thinking that. I could borrow Brandy, but she's a bit of a handful, isn't she? No, you can't borrow Brandy because she's a nightmare and you'll have a nervous break. But you could borrow Baxter or Shirley. Can I like, borrow Baxter? Oh my God, I'd love to borrow Baxter. Baxter's my G. Wait, I think you need to tell us about your dogs, Kate. <laughs> so I've got two dogs. Well, at the moment I've got three dogs for my sins. Uh, I've had Baxter, he's my firstborn. Uh, I got him when he was a puppy and he's now nine. He'll be 10 in November. He'll be 10 in November, which means he'll be 70 in human years, which means he'll be in the at-risk group. God. Oh, Baxt. <laughs> Shirley from the square. And then I've also got Shirley from the square. Come here, Shirley. Come on up. She's always a mess. <laughs> Shirley, you're a mess. Yes, she is. <laughs> Shirley, you're an absolute mess. Say hello to little Shirley from the square. Little death breath. Your breath smells of seaweed. How is this possible? Um, Shirley's a rescue. We got her last year. Uh, no, we got her two years ago. Um, she's about three. She's going to be three. No, she's three now. She'll be about four. We don't know how old she is, but she's roughly three. And she's so needy. And she's so lovely. And she was a nightmare when we first got her. Like an actual nightmare. And for three months, I was like, what have we done? I wish we never adopted her, but now I couldn't imagine my life without you, Shirley from the square. And her name was Pickles when we first got her, but because when, her, when she just come out of the shower and her hair looks like that, she looks like Shirley from EastEnders, Shirley Carter. That's why we called her Shirley. And she's got an amazing skill of um, when she, she tries to chase squirrels up trees and actually makes her way up the tree trunk. About oh. halfway. Squirrel? Squirrel? Hey, bro. Oh, I love her. Then we've got Baxter, we've got Shirley, and then this is Brandy. Look at her fringe. She looks like she's got a bowler in it. <laughs> Look at you. This is Brandy. Uh, she's a rescue from Spain. She came over uh, and lived with a family 
in Portsmouth for a little while and it didn't work out with them because she was really aggressive towards their dog. So then she, she got rehomed to a family in London. They lasted two days with her. And then she ended up with the, this woman called Michelle who lives up the road. Don't you growl at him. So this is her problem, right? Because I'm holding her and Baxter has come near me. You dare. Oh, shit. <laughs> oh, Baxter. Baxter just headbutted this. <laughs> it's my guy. <laughs> Little miniature. Look at you. They're like a teddy bear. Oh, he's so lovely. His ears smell of caramel. I love it. He's so chill as well. He's just the chill, chillest dog. <laughs> he is. You know what? Today, he didn't want to come for a walk. Got ready. Asked the dogs who wanted to go walk. The two girls were just, boom, straight down the stairs. He was upstairs with Bodge in bed. I was like, you're not coming? And he was like, he's not going anywhere. He's like a human. He was like, no, thank you. I don't want to go for a walk. I'm having a lay and it's Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> so chill. Um... So yes, so Brandy is the rescue dog. She's just been passed from pillar to post. So basically we've just said, we'll, we'll foster her until she finds a new um, owner because we need to do lots of training with her because she's so naughty. She wheezes and poos inside the house and she barks, at, she barks at people doing exercise in the park. Like anyone jogging or doing sit-ups or squats, she's over there. She is just like barking in their face. So we need, we're having a little online training session with this guy Luke tomorrow to try and... Um, to try and get her better because at the moment she's a nightmare and this is how I want her to be. Yeah. Chill. Look at him, he's like a statue. <laughs> you can borrow him, Georgie, if you want. I know, I'd love to. Oh, it'd be so dreamy. Just a little just Where's a little geek. Where's Auntie Georgie? <laughs> Where's Auntie Georgie, darling? No. Look, she's there. <laughs> we should also talk about your podcast maybe baby tell us, oh. tell us about that and, and how it's been because obviously podcasts and having a successful podcast is quite different to having a, a daily radio show yeah the podcast was um it's a funny one like a lot of people were saying to me a couple of years ago you should do a podcast podcasting is becoming really big and I was like, yeah, I'd like to, but I don't just want to do a podcast for the sake of doing one. Like, I'm not just going to do a, oh, here's a weekly podcast about what's going on in my life. I do that every day on the radio. So I just, I wasn't prepared to do one unless I come up with an idea. And then um, my fiance and I were talking about children as we've done, like, since we first got together. And the debate that we always have is whether or not to have them. And he really wants kids. I've never wanted kids. And I was like, we should do a podcast about this because it's very rare. Well, it is in my case. Um, and everyone I know, like none of my friends are the same as me to have a woman who doesn't want kids, but the, but the man does. Cause most, most of the time it's the other way around. And, and the women are like, come on. And the guy's like, go on then. That's, that's how it's been for me and my friends. I know it's not the case with everybody. But yeah, we just wanted to do a podcast about uh, the, the debate around having children and like why so many women are now leaving it to later on in life or just not doing it at all. Because, you know, it's becoming more common, yet there's still a bit of stigma around women who choose not to have children. You always get the, oh, but why don't you want kids then? And I feel like saying, well, you'd be really offended if you told me you were pregnant and I said to you, oh, why do you want kids? So the frustration of that and just basically the situation that me and my fiance were in, I thought were good enough reasons to do a podcast. So we did um, a 12 part series called Maybe Baby. And we interviewed like celebrity guests about each stage of um, having a baby from uh, conceptions, pregnancy to birth to newborns, raising children, not having children at all. And yeah, it did really well. And actually it helped us. Like now I feel like we, if we do decide to have a baby or at least try to have a baby, we are going into it being so well informed because we've learned so much. Did you know like your fanny can turn blue when you're pregnant? I never knew that. <laughs> what? Why? Um, I don't know. Um, we did find this out. It was very early on the series. But yeah, blue vaginas are a thing. Never knew that. Um, wild. Babies, like, they don't drink water until they're like six months old. I just didn't know. <laughs> I, I, I can't believe I didn't know that. And I was just like, so they don't have a little bit of water. And people were like, no, just milk, just milk. So they're like, who knew? Um, 
So did it make you more open to the idea of having a baby or were you just completely put off? I mean, Blue Fanny sounds pretty terrifying. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I've got to say, there were episodes where I'd come out of the recording and I'd say to to Bodge, all right, let's do it. Because everyone we spoke to, and do you know what? It's the same for everybody I speak to outside of the podcast as well. Every parent I've ever met, friends, family, strangers, people on the podcast, people who've got in touch via Instagram, or via email from, from maybe baby. All parents tell me the same thing and they all say, it's the hardest thing you'll ever do, but it's also the best thing you'll ever do. I like the way they always start with the hardest thing because it blatantly is so tiring and exhausting. Um, but they all say the same thing. And, and so I'm like, there's days, and even now there's days where I think, oh God, you know what, let's just do it. Let's just do it. Let's go upstairs, let's do it, let's try. And then there's other days where I'm like, you know what? I've gone this far in life without having a child and I'm really happy. So what's the point in risking me not being happy? And I know that if I were to get pregnant and I were to grow a baby and I were to have it cut out of me because there's absolutely no way I push it out of my vagina, that scares me so much. There's no way I wouldn't love it. Like, people always say to me, but you'd be a great mum. And I'm like, I know. But it doesn't mean that I should have a child. I am a great mum to the dogs. I'd also be a great stripper, but I'm not going to go and be a stripper. Do you know what I mean? So I don't feel like that I, sh- you know, I don't owe it to anyone to have a child. And it's if I don't want if I don't want kids, then it's my decision at the end of the day. But I am with somebody who does want to be a dad, and I know he'd be a great dad to a little human being. So it is such a hard decision for me right now because I'm going to be 40 in a few months as well. So I know that my body clock is, you know, I'm, I'm on a, I'm on a pretty short time scale now. I went to a fertility clinic. I found out that I've got quite a low egg count for my age. So that just like scared me slightly. And I just, we've been talking about the whole kid thing a lot actually in the last couple of weeks, because our plan was to get married and then possibly start trying if I was ready come the end of this year. And I was just like, well, we're not getting married now, are we? And then, Bodge was like, well, let's, we could try for a baby. You know? The last thing I want to be now is pregnant. Like, not while this horrible virus is here and we don't know how long it's here to stay for. So that's the last thing I want. But also, the wedding's being delayed and I, don't, I wouldn't want to try for a baby out of wedlock. So my time is running out and I, I soon won't be able to, debate, to be able to debate whether I have a child or not. Do you know what I mean? Soon that decision will be taken out of my hands because I'll go through the menopause. So it's a really horrible situation to be in. I don't regret not doing it sooner because I've lived, I've just, I've had the best life and I've done everything I want to do before it. And the happiest parents I know, if I'm going to be completely honest with you, are the parents that have had kids later on in life because they've still had a chance to do everything they want to do. All the partying, all the drinking, all the fun stuff, all the festivals, all the raves, all the shagging, all those relationships. And then they've just finally settled down, which is why I believe I'd probably enjoy being a mum more now as an older mum and I would be seen as an older mum because I would be having a baby well into my 40s I think that I I still think that I've made the right decision waiting despite the fact that I would be an older mum there's just so much pressure isn't there on I say societal pressure on women it's like at different ages it's like oh you should be married by now you should be having babies by now and all of that yeah right and especially if you work in an industry as well which is like a creative industry uh, yeah. where, you know it's it can be quite a difficult and daunting thing the cost of having a kid and then the the what's that going to do for your career what's that going to do like there's so many it's a lot of big questions isn't it yeah I think women sacrifice so much like we would we, you know back in the day we couldn't have it all it was you know standard for you to be getting married when you were 18 and having a baby at the same time and never working and always being at home being a mother and providing for your family and now women can have, we can have the career we can be mums but the price we pay is that we have a career first and then have a child which means that we might not be able to get pregnant as quickly as we would have had we not have had the career you know I've got a lot of friends I know so many women who are struggling to get pregnant and it's because we are waiting like the optimal time biologically for a woman to have a baby is when you're 18 to 21 because you have all the eggs and you're young and but you know 
women want to have careers women want to make their own money we want you know like that's that's what I've always wanted I've never ever wanted to kid I just wanted to have a career I wanted to make my own money I wanted to own my own property but it's really difficult because then you have you try and do it alongside that and it's really tricky I mean actually Bodge is uh, just employed someone she's a young mum and she's really lucky because his company are quite good with flexible working hours and she's 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 only in her early 20s and she's got a little boy but she's doing really well but it's not the same for every woman like you know if you if you have a baby in your 30s or however old you are and you are like at a point where you're just about to have you know to step up and you're having had to have a promotion if you have a child and you're off for six months to a year that that sets you back so much and it's such a disadvantage for women um and men are so lucky to not have that do you know what i mean yeah and even when you are working like they're just i mean i don't know if the same broadcasting but just the working hours and you know i'll be away for months at a time it's just not set up for having a kid you basically i mean we've through these conversations this has come up a few times with mj yesterday and with um susie and natalie about you know you kind of almost have to change roles and you know have a Uh more stable job and in that case you're kind of sacrificing what you really wanted to do in the first place yeah but there are women you know who've all they've ever dreamt of is you know being a mum and that's great and I love you know I love for all my friends that are just you know, full-time mums I have so much respect for them because being a mum I've, I've, I've just I've learned this just from seeing my friends and seeing how hard no Brandy sorry she's trying to eat my sock um my friends who like who are full-time mums and have more than one kid it's just it is a full-time gig you are it is 24 seven. There is no rest, especially like I've noticed it the last couple of weeks with seeing, you know, people homeschooling and also having to make sure the house is tidy and also make sure there's food on the table. Um, it is a really hard gig to try and do both. Um, like I've got friends, like one of my friends is a pediatric nurse and she's up every morning at like 5 a.m. She's dropping her little girl off to the nursery near the hospital and then she's doing like 12 hour days and then she goes and picks the, her little baby up and then she has to go home and feed it and then she has to cook dinner and it's just, her life is just, I, can't, I just can't imagine ever being like that. I'm quite fortunate to have a job where the hours aren't so long. So I think if I had a child, it would be quite easy or easier uh, to kind of manage work life and mum life. Um, but yeah, I just, I feel for women who, who try and do both because it is you either you know you either want to be a mum and that's great and you're quite happy to stay at home in which case you know you don't have anything to really you don't have any worries but then if you really want to push your career and have a child it's it's a tricky one isn't it yeah definitely Um, yeah no you go you go called Anna Whitehouse do you follow her mother pucker on instagram she does uh, like flexible working hours especially with mums and like it's really good to see people out there like fighting for I don't know like mothers working mums rights because I think the more companies realize and it could happen during this lockdown the more companies realize that women are able to work from home and do just as good a job as if they were working in an office or wherever then hopefully women won't feel as like pressured into like not having a child because they want to keep their job do you know what I mean Definitely. And um, I want to kind of talk a bit about social media and stuff because you, I mean, you, you do it so well. Like it's so funny. Your content is always so engaging and, and it sort of is similar to the radio show and it's, it's very like, it's a look into your life. It's the dogs, it's work, it's funny things that like that amuse you. Um, but in this time, obviously like we're bombarded with loads of news and everything's quite scary outside of that. What's a good way to approach it? Because it's kind of a time where people can really optimise on building more of a following and being more visible and doing more social content, but then also it's kind of overwhelming at the same time. Yeah, that's one thing I've thought long and hard about over the last couple of weeks as well. Like, what Am I putting stuff out that's right for the time we're in? Because it is undoubtedly the weirdest time, the most difficult time, and you always have to think that, there are people out there less fortunate than you or that aren't having a good time. Like I'm a true believer that if you have a routine in your life, it can make you feel better, especially in times like this. I, I just think routine at the moment is paramount. I think you have to, and I've said this on Instagram, like genuinely it's, it's okay. If you are not your most productive during a global pandemic, that's fine. I, I, 
I can understand people who are anxious, worried, and they're not feeling motivated at all. Um, news is obviously making people feel really scared. But like, if you can get up every morning at the same time, if you can shower, brush your teeth and just get dressed, I feel like that would just, just make you feel so much better than if you were to just sit in your pajamas all day. Scroll. Yeah. And I've, 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 like, I've done a few things on my Instagram about that, but I don't want to be too heavy. But I just think it's important to, like, you know, a lot of people have been saying, oh, I'm really enjoying your Friday night date nights with the handsome, because we every Friday for the last few weeks, we've been just having a date night indoors. But I don't want to be that person to be like, oh, look at me, I'm having a date. Isn't my relationship so great? We're staying in and we're having a nice time, because like, we piss each other off during the week. So you have to make sure that you just strike, a, strike the right tone and balance of what you're posting on, on social media. Like, I don't, like, I've seen a few posts of, you know, that I've, I've, I've thought, oh, is that the right thing to be doing right now? Like, where people are just kind of, it's all a bit too, because you know, like lots of people are losing their jobs and people are taking pay cuts and some families can't even afford to you know, feed their children. So I feel like if you're staying in, but showing off drinking like bottles of champagne, it's not the right tone, do you know what I mean? And it doesn't set a good example. But I just, for me, I just want to make people feel better. If you are a key worker, if you've worked, 12 day shift especially if you're a nurse or a doctor and you are treating patients with COVID-19 if I can make like the amount of messages I've got it makes me almost want to cry the amount of messages I've got especially from people who work in the NHS carers cleaners and stuff saying after a long hard day at work thank you for cheering me up you've really made me smile it's what I really needed I've had the worst day um working with um people who are literally dying in front of me thank you so much for like providing some respite which you know i'm happy with that if i can make people smile definitely one of the funniest things i think you've ever done on instagram uh you've done a lot of funny things but the uh table service for shirley so kate and bodge <laughs> you obviously had had a bit of dinner maybe a couple of wines and uh got a bottle of vodka and a light and then did like pretended like shirley was in the club <laughs> Table service. I, I was. I woke up the next day and I was still laughing about that. We, so... um, yeah, we were first Friday night in. We we had like a hip hop R and B night, and then last Friday it was old school garage. So we had like rip groove on, and Bod was like, "Let's make espresso martinis," and he got this bottle of vodka out from like our drinks trolley thing, and I was like, "Why have you got Belvedere vodka, you wanker?" Like, we're not in a club. And then I was like, "Actually, this will be funny," because then straight away I just think, "Oh, what can we?" Do? with that and I was like why don't you pretend because basically Shirley was really watching him carry the vodka and I was like she wants that so I was like let's pretend Shirley's in the VIP section and you're like you're at the club and you were taking the vodka to her and then I was like go and put some sunglasses on and he was like I'm not I was like just go and put some sunglasses on and then I was like I know the robe light that I that I accidentally took from a nightclub in Birmingham a few years ago and um, I was like bring that in as well and then like we just, like, I just kept filming him bringing the, 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 the vodka in with the light to Rip Room. And Shirley was just sat like, in her VIP area, not letting anyone else in, waiting for her vodka. We thought it was, I mean, I thought, it, I didn't think it was that funny. But when I filmed it and I watched it back, I was laughing. I was like, this is, this is probably going to be one for like, people will, people will find this funny. And I just, honestly, so many people loved it. Just stupid stuff like that, isn't it? <sighs> How do you, um, like, what would be your advice to anyone like wanting to kind of create their own content and um, get a bit of a, a following going? Like, how would you do that? It's weird. Like, I don't know. I'm not really that, I'm not, I don't think I'm in the position to give advice on that because I don't have a huge, I don't have a huge Instagram following. I'm not like, you know, I haven't got millions of followers. I've got a really nice following and I've got, I've built up such a nice little community on my Instagram and I feel like being myself is just that's what's that's what's helped me get followers just being myself and sharing what's going on in my life and the dogs and stuff like that but I guess a lot of people on Instagram would say find a specific thing like if you are really good at cooking then do make sure your feed is all about cooking if you are a really good at photography make sure it's all your photography and for me it's just a bit of everything I, ha I don't have that, that one thing like, I love fitness I love my dogs I don't enjoy cooking but I like doing Instagram stories while I'm cooking because it always goes wrong and I just think it's funny and then I love you know showcasing what I do at work on there so that can actually have quite a negative impact for me making money off my Instagram because if I'm put up for a job 
to do some kind of like collaboration with, for example, a lipstick brand, they'll always pick the person who is a makeup artist or somebody who's focused on makeup. Do you know what I mean? So it's quite hard for me to get um, collaborations in that sense. But I just think do what you love on Instagram. If you really like cooking, then make, then make, make your Instagram all about food. If you love fitness, then have a fitness Instagram. But for me, like if someone said to me, you need to make your Instagram just dogs or just fitness or just food, I'd be like, no, no, thank you. I just like doing a bit of everything. Is there anything that you've learned about yourself during this time of lockdown and social distancing? Um, I'm a warrior. I've learned that I'm just, I'm just I, I knew I was a warrior before, but I am, I'm extremely paranoid at the minute. Like I am, I need to sort it out, but I'm trying my best because I'm meditating more. I love the app Calm. I love that. It really sorts me out. If I read news late at night and I'm freaking out in bed, I'll do that. I've learned I'm probably a lot more, um, a lot more patient because even though I've said to you that I'm going out a lot to work and my, my, um, my life is quite, I'm just, I'm experiencing normality on a daily basis apart from at the weekend because I'm still going to work. I feel like with having three dogs and I'm constantly cleaning as well because we're home so much, we are just making so much mess. I feel like my patience, cause I'm, I'm going to be quite impatient at times, but I feel like I'm a lot more patient now. I don't, I don't, I'm not trying to say that the Hanson's pissing me off, but like, you know, when you spend a lot of time with someone and you've got three dogs and one of them's pissing in your flat constantly, you need to like, I, I've, so many times I thought I would probably, that old me would have lost it, but you always have to put things into perspective. I don't know if I've learned anything else about myself, really. I can't really answer that any better. Soz. I've learned that I talk to myself constantly. Like if I'm alone, oh, I'm just chatting away. Like a running, a running commentary of what I'm doing and what I'm going to be doing. And like, it's very, yeah, it's, I've really learned that over the last eight days of isolation and not seeing anyone. Is it something you did before or is this just a new thing? No, I think it's, I think I always, because whenever I've sort of thought, oh, I'm turning into my mum, because she does it. So I've always thought, yeah, no, I think I like, there's an element of it, but it's just like amped up to 12 at the moment. Do you, ever, do you ever practice being on the radio? <laughs> oh, uh, no, not really. No, no, no. It's more a really, really boring, mundane internal monologue. Yeah. Like, you're like a running to-do list. It's really not helpful for anyone or exciting for anyone. <laughs> Your internal monologue, I mean, I laugh, but then I guess, because I have the dogs, I tell them everything we're going to do. Like, mummy, mummy's just going to have a shower. I will be back in a minute. They don't, they don't understand me. They don't speak English. But I tell them everything. I talk to them constantly. So I guess that's the same thing. Me talking to the dogs and you talking to yourself. I've learned that I can bake. I'm actually not a bad baker. We made, we made, uh, made a lemon drizzle cake last week. And I was like, it's going to be shit. I can't bake. I can bake. I'm actually not that. I'm actually better than Mary Berry. <laughs> Statement. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not. I'm not. But I'm actually not a bad baker. Yeah. I mean, you mentioned um, that you're doing your meditation. Like, do you have any tips for just staying sane? Um, I think the routine, like I was saying, if you want to stay sane, you need a routine. You need to get up and you need to brush your teeth. Even if you don't shower, splash your face with water and get dressed. Um, the, the exercising has really helped me. I, I've done more exercise in the, indoors in the last two weeks than I have the entire year. From January up until March, I was so lazy. I did hardly anything. And then I've really got into these online workouts. There are so many you can do. And I know it's easier said than done, but honestly, if you can just... I'm not doing half an hour workouts. I'm doing 10 to 15 minute workouts because I get bored. I'm like, if I know I've got half an hour or an hour workout ahead of me, I won't do it. So online workouts, I always look up 15 minute abs or 10 minute butt workout or whatever. And I'm, I'm loving them. And that is keeping me sane when I'm feeling like I need to get out of the house. Um, we're lucky we've got dogs. Walking them is so good. Like if you, you know, the government have told us that we are allowed to go out and exercise. If you're not utilizing that opportunity, then that will drive you insane. Um, 
the calm app as well is really really good for like morning and evening like in the morning it's a different kind of meditation in the evening it's a more like body scan try and like breathe deep because in the evening i get really like wound up watching the news and stuff like that which i probably need to do less of but yeah staying sane i guess you could probably watch less news less serious news because it's great to be well informed during this time don't get me wrong but you also need to kind of not consume it so much that it makes you feel like you're gonna like start crying because that's how i felt recently georgie what about you staying sane um i'm listening to a lot of music i'm making a lot of like i'm doing a lot of like work stuff like in development work stuff like not that i get paid for but that's for you know future things like thinking of ideas making dj mixes making playlists like just putting a record on a day just and just like just taking a bit of time out to like listen to records and vinyl and just get a screen break because we've been talking with with the other women that we've had on this and it's like you know if you're working from home and then watching stuff in the evening like I think the other day I probably was looking at a screen and concentrating on a screen for 15 hours of the day and I felt fried at the end of it so just trying to yeah not do not do too much and just like I can't I'm I was getting into a routine before I was going to bed of like reading the day's news and I can't do that now. I just, yeah. I tell you what we're enjoying, board games, which yeah. we always loved anyway, but we bought a new one. Bodger was like, I'm going to search the best board games for two players. And we bought a game called Ticket to Ride. Have you got it? Have you played it for? We're not. Oh my God, it's so much fun. And it takes ages. So like one game will last us the whole evening after dinner and then we go to bed. So like board games, I've got to say, they just, they're great because they, you can play them with all the family, friends. You can do it online you via house party last Sunday with my mates from work. Like it's that sort of stuff that keeps you sane because you're still having that human interaction with people outside your home, even though it's not, real life it's like on a screen it's still something Do you know it's better than nothing i think yeah and just lastly as well like best thing you've been watching any box sets curb your enthusiasm <laughs> curb your enthusiasm has literally made my 2020 De larry david right have you watched so his season 10's just come out on sky now this has been running for so many years right but his latest series are the best and the funniest series nine series 10 you've absolutely rinsed honestly it is and it's the perfect thing you need because right now everyone's really scared everyone's really panicking but like it's so funny laugh out loud funny i will happily watch season 10 <laughs> quiet <laughs> quiet <laughs> enough shirley from the square <laughs> Curb you have them. i can't rec recommend it enough have you watched it no, um, no. I tried Arrested Development. I tried to start that, but c c can you just jump in on Curb Your Enthusiasm? Can you just jump in yes. series nine? Yes, yes. Yeah. There's certain things where you'll be like, you'll have to pick up who's who because they've had the same cast for all the seasons. And like, when you watch it in like, from seasons one to 10, then you get to know the cast and you get to know the relationships between people. So you find it funnier, but you could, I would start, just start season nine and then watch season 10. It's so good. Larry David is so funny. I mean, he's the guy who wrote Seinfeld and like that was funny. But this is just, he just gets himself into trouble in every episode and he says stuff he shouldn't. And it's so cringy. It's so funny. And it's like almost, you're watching it going, I'd so, that's so me. Like I would be like that as well. So that has got us through it. Curb your enthusiasm, ticket to ride <laughs> and online workouts. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you so much. That was great. Thank you so much, Kate. Thanks, Thanks Kate. Guys.